The Ensonic ESQ-1, the story of a new era in synthesizers. The 80s was truly an incredible time for music technology. Making music as the world transitioned from analog to digital was at times as frustrating as it was rewarding. Micro and personal computers were becoming something every household now had, and it was from this scene where Insonic was born. In the 70s, Commodore business machines had sprung up from a small company to something relatively large-scale quickly with the massive the success the of the Commodore VIC-20 and 64 the models. Commodore 64, what nobody else can give you. Utilizing VLSI technology to condense down the circuitry typically found on dense motherboards to a single IC, they were able to reduce the cost of production and put sophisticated technology into a small computer and the homes of millions around the globe. One of these VLSI chips, the MOS Technology 6581, or known as the SID chip, was developed by Bob Yanis and was used in the Commodore 64 to bring music and audio to an incredible level for a home computer. The SID chip was essentially a synthesizer on a chip and was very unique for home computers of this era, which didn't often give much attention to audio. In 1982, Bob Yanis, along with co-workers Bruce Crockett and Al Charpentier, left Commodore together, forming a new company called Peripheral Visions Inc. with the ambitious goal to compete with Commodore. After a year of setting up the company and in the middle of a global recession, it became clear that it'd be difficult for Peripheral Visions to compete with the massive success of the Commodore 64, and they pivoted in direction, deciding to focus on electronic music products. Leveraging their design strengths, they designed a new VLSI, the 5503 Digital Oscillator, or DOC chip. Rebranding the company to Insonic, they started to work on two projects, a sampler and a synthesizer. Capitalizing on their VLSI design experience, they knew they were able to provide a rich feature set for their products at a much lower cost than their competition. This was important, as the world economy was in the middle of a recession, and expensive synthesizers and samplers were often out of reach for most musicians. With the release of the sleek and user-friendly Mirage in 1984, Insonic turned the music world on its head, bringing sampling technology to the masses at an incredibly low price of $16.95 US. Although limited in features and sample memory, the 8-bit Mirage was a huge success, with a sound quality comparable to Emu's Emulator 2 for a quarter of the price tag. Many users loved the Mirage's distinctive sound, as internally, the 8-bit sampler coupled with Curtis Music 3328 filters sonically just sat well on a mix and the music of that era, much of which was electronica, dance, and early house music. The Sonic's Mirage sampler was quickly followed up in early 1986 by their fledgling synthesizer, the ESQ-1. At a very competitive list price of 1500 US dollars, the ESQ-1 really captured the state of synthesis during this mid-80s period, where a transition was happening from fully analog to entirely digital instruments. And Sonic's engineers looked at how Yamaha's DX line used digital technology to create and modify waveforms, along with how PPG was using a larger palette of bass waveforms as wave cycle oscillators to provide sample quality sounds to create the bases of the ESQ-1 architecture. Once again, the 5503 dock chip was at its core as a sound generating IC, coupled with the 6809 microprocessor. Sonically, the best part of the ESQ-1 was that it incorporated the Curtis Music 3379 filters, giving the digital nature of this synthesizer a smooth analog signal path before hitting the mixing output stage. The ESQ-1 features eight voices, with three oscillators per voice. These true digital oscillators could play back any one of the 32 waveforms stored in Lookup WaveROM as a single cycle waveform, similar to how the PPG Wave and the DX7 worked. The 32 available waveforms were a mix of classic synth waveforms, wave samples, formants, and band-limited waveforms. These three oscillators would then mix together, creating complex and realistic sounds. To improve realism, Insonic also provided multi-sampling to some of the wave samples, such as piano. This helped the synth retain the realism during playback of these wave samples at different octaves across the keyboard. 
Insonic's 40 character by 2 VFD display was also quite unique for its time, giving the synth a stylish look that could be read easily on stage in a darker environment. I also find the layout of the ESQ1 to be very easy to understand, with a soft button key press for patch and voice programming around the display, and also set within a diagram of the synth architecture right on the panel. This is really great user interface design. With three oscillators per voice, the ability to create patches containing a mix of these digital waveforms gave the ESQ-1 a very rich sound, something that was beyond what Roland's JXAP and Korg's DW8000 were offering at the time. Some people often compare the sound of the ESQ-1 to the PPG Wave 2, the Kawhi K3, or the Prophet VS synths of this era. The ESQ-1's built-in sequencer was also a real powerhouse, with the ability to store up to 10 songs with 8 tracks each and a total of 24,000 notes. A sequencer this powerful within the keyboard itself was unheard of at this time, and essentially was a starting point for what would become the workstation keyboard era in the years to follow. Another great feature set of the ESQ-1 is its modulation matrix, where any of the three LFOs can be assigned to any of the three DCAs, oscillators, or the filter with at times extreme settings. Adding in a ring modulator and oscillator sync as well gave the synth incredible sound creation possibilities. Even stereo panning can be assigned to a modulation from the LFO, envelope, velocity, or key position, which makes for some great stereo field effects. Also unique to the ESQ-1 was the ability to change a patch while playing a note, without the patch changing until the next key is pressed. This is such a great feature for the live musician. Because of its excellent feature set and low price point, the ESQ-1 went on to sell around 50,000 units, such an incredible number for that era. The all-metal case made the ESQ-1 a real beast, and it has to be close to 40 pounds in weight. Some of the later units were manufactured in Japan and feature a much lighter plastic chassis. Mostly because of its affordability, it became a favorite synth for the creators of underground electronic music, most notably Skinny Puppy, where it was used on tracks such as Warlock and Tester. So where does this leave the ESQ-1 today? It definitely has that mid-80s sound. Its hybrid nature puts it in a similar space as Roland's D50, Korg's DW8000, and the Prophet BS. Personally, I find it to be much more full and smoother sounding, probably helped by the Curtis filter on each voice. Because there are so many ESQ-1s still in operation today, 
you can still get fresh RAM and ROM cartridges from resellers on eBay to breathe new life into a tired sound set. With some effects added, I also find the SQ1 to sit really well in the mix. In Sonic and the ESQ-1 are an 80s treasure, and the large user community to this day is a testament to how deeply this synth impacted the creativity of so many musicians. <laughs> <laughs>